Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second in our series of Mastering Magellan webinars. And this one, we're going to take a little bit of, of a deep dive into the theming and really get into some, some cool and, and tricky CSS work. Um, today, um, this webinar is being presented by myself, Paul Trotter, and my colleague, Matthew Armstrong. So welcome, Matthew. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Paul, what I'm going to ask you to do, it looks like uh, people are still slowly coming into the room. So maybe just uh, redo your introduction in about another 30 or 40 seconds. No worries, we've got some, you've got quite a few people jumping in now. It looks like we've got the bulk of the people that are joining already here. So again, welcome everybody to the second in our series of Mastering Magellan um, webinars. And we're going to be going into some more detail on uh, advanced theming is our topic today and um, getting under the hood with CSS. So let's take a quick look at our agenda today. Today we're going to first start off by looking at an example um, theme created by one of our customers. And uh, I think this particular customer has done a great job and has some really nice examples of both, both the basic theming that we covered in our last webinar um, and also some advanced theming that, um, that they've managed to do. And we'll cover off those examples. We're gonna take a detailed look at the structure of the Magellan application and how that relates to the CSS that we're going to be using to theme it. Um, then we're going to go through the two main kinds of theming, which is application theming, application being the Magellan application itself and controlling the look and feel of that. And then the content theming being all of the content that comes from Authorit and the way that's going to appear within the Magellan application. And we'll finish off with some questions and answers. So before we jump in, just like to um, welcome you all here today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days. For those of you um, that have come back from vacation, welcome back. I hope you had a great time. For those of you heading out on vacation soon, I'm wishing you uh, a great vacation. And for those of you actually on vacation and attending this webinar, well, that's pretty hardcore, so well done. We're all going through a bit of a... Uh, a strange year this year so my uh, my thoughts go out to all of you I hope you're all keeping safe and um, that you're all um, keeping healthy before we uh, get started in into the detail of the webinar I'd like to remind people just of the scope of author it um, just to give you a little bit more of a um, an idea of what author it can do for you many of you use author it for one or two things, and, and I just want to point out all of the great things that we can do. So Authorit brings together an end-to-end -end content management system that allows you to create um, all of your content in a single place. Now you can do that by bringing in your existing content, by uh, having subject matter experts contribute in a very simple to use web interface, or having your full power of your authoring system for the technical writers. Um, our Content management system that allows you to reuse that content, translate it, manage it, um, manage security and workflows, and then deliver it out to uh, a variety of different outputs, including technical pubs output like PDFs and web help, um, product manuals, but also to learning type outputs for SCORM, which is learning, micro learning and presentations. So there's a variety of ways in which you can use author it to deliver your content. 
I also just want to run through quickly a reminder of what Magellan is. Now we covered the basics in our first webinar, and I'm not going to go into a, a detailed demo in this webinar. But if you are new to Magellan, please go and have a look at the previous webinar to get the foundational work. But Magellan's this modern, responsive, and adaptive HTML5 application um, that dynamically displays content. And rather than being a traditional way of generating a set of HTML pages, which uh, get opened um, on the browser, we're actually generating content chunks, which get loaded in by the Magellan application, which is distributed. And this Magellan application separates the content from the presentation of the, um, of the final content, giving us huge amounts of flexibility over how we choose to present that content and configure the behavior of the application. Now, the process by which Magellan is published is sort of illustrated in this diagram. We start off in our author at database and the publishing process uses or exports what's called a resolved XML file. It's a, it's a XML file of the, the book that you've chosen to publish with the filters and the variance settings that you've given it. We then use an XSLT to process that XML file, and that results in a series of JSON, which are a, a way of providing structured data um, to JavaScript, and HTML content files. We add to that the any media images or other resources that you've included in your author at output, and we combine all of that together, create index files, and deliver that to an output folder, which we then combine with the Magellan application to deliver the final result. So the content and the Magellan application are quite separate. The Magellan application is something that we will continue to develop and improve and change, and that your content is simply combined with that. Right, now we're gonna go through an example. Now I'm just gonna um, turn off my video while we're going through the rest of this webinar because it tends to overlap some of the content, and I wanna make sure you guys don't miss anything. Right, so we're gonna take a look at a really cool example that one of our customers built. This is the Localus Pulse Help Center. Um, I've got screenshots of both the landing page and the content page here. And I just wanna highlight some of the really cool things that we've put together in this theme. Both the advanced and, and the basic theming. So first of all, David Jones, who many of you may have heard of, is very active on our community. And I just want to give a big shout out to David for his um, help to many of you as you're going through these questions. Community is a great place to ask questions and to get answers from. We can't always guarantee we're going to give you exactly what you want, but there's some really knowledgeable people on there. So feel free to, to jump on there when you've got a question. So David created this uh, help center using um, the basic Magellan themes and the advanced. Now, we, we covered all of the basic stuff in the previous webinar, and he was able to set most of the theming elements using our default CSS variables and configuration settings, which is really great. Um, but there were a few things he wanted to do that couldn't be done with the defaults, and those are the sort of things that we're covering today. So a summary of what he did was change the icons that sit up on the toolbar to be a different color from the theme setting. By default, the icons are connected to the primary color, and he wanted to have a different color. Um, he wanted to add a new CSS variable that allowed him to have a, a what he called a banner color and use that in different parts of the application. I'll show you how that works. Um, he hit the discuss icon, the language drop down, and also the share icon. And these have been pretty common requests. Uh, change the default position of the hamburger menu icon in mobile mode. This is quite a, a clever little change. And, and for his theme, it made sense for him to do that and um, use a nice little CSS trick to make that work. And I'll, I'll point that out when we get in there. And there was a particular table behavior he didn't like when you were resizing. Um, and that was caused by some white space setting on one of the paragraph styles. And so just something to be aware of. Um, if you're seeing a behavior you don't like, check this white space setting. And we'll have a look at that in, um, 
in the example. So now I'm going to just take you through a quick presentation of his theme in real life. And you guys can also feel free to check this out when you, um, when you finish the webinar. So we've got the Pulse Help Center here. Um, he's made really great use of these um, promoted content blocks and also of the rotator box. So the content, uh, promoted content blocks are really great because you can just click on any of them um, and it'll jump you straight into that particular part of the help center. So they're a really nice way to bring, um, bring people to a specific place. Now in here, we've got the things that he's changed. So if you look up here, these icons here are a different color, okay? Um, the discuss icon, which is usually visible in this drop down, is, is no longer visible. Uh, the language, which is usually up here, is no longer visible. And also the share icon, which is also usually visible in this drop down, is not there. So he turned all of those off. Now, some of those things since David's changes have now been added as features. So, for example, you can turn discuss on or off from the settings and it will make that disappear all by itself. So you don't have to. Um, now, I want to look at this uh, mobile mode. Um, if we drop this down to a mobile size, um, you will see here that the icon, the hamburger icon is actually on the right hand side. Now, if I drop over to my example and we switch to the content view, um, you will see here that it's not in that same location. So if we do here, and here, I've actually got it hidden in my example, but usually it shows up here. And I will, uh, it, which makes sense in this particular theme because I've got a white background on my logo. Now, because he had a dark background on his logo, it, it looked funny just sitting over here. So he made it jump to the right. And I'll show you how to do that in CSS a bit later on. Um, he also changed the table. Um, white space behavior, which just made the tables resize in a nicer way. So that's David Jones's example of the Pulse Help Center. Um, thanks, David, for uh, sharing that with us and letting me present it here today. Okay, let's jump forward now. And uh, today I'm going to go through the, the basic structure of a um, Magellan site, and we'll start with the landing page. We're gonna talk a bit about CSS and then we'll jump into the changes themselves. So as I pointed out, Magellan Scott runs in two modes. It runs in a landing page mode, which you see here, and it also runs in a content mode. In the landing page mode, we have three key sections. And these um, text in red are gonna to relate to sections in the CSS. And so that's why I've Put these illustrations here so you can see the relationship. Um, if we take away all of the look and look at the wireframe, this is actually what's going on underneath. So the header has three sections. Um, the navigation bar sits here. Then we've got the, con the title and search area, the rotator, which has these content or these rotator items, which have a heading and a body. Um, and we have a section here we can put in promoted content, and then the promoted content items followed by the footer. Now the content page here is actually something that can float in or out with one of the um, options on the landing page. The next item here is the Magellan content page, and it's a similar structure at the top. We've got the header and the nav bar both reused. Um, the difference is the search now drops into the space here that was empty on the on the um, landing page and on the we've got the left navigation bar the content block and the right navigation bar again if we look at that in a wireframe view um, you'll see that we've got various boxes including breadcrumbs right navigation and the widgets which there's several of them um, and they're both comprised of a header and a body so that's the basic structure now Let's have a look at how theming works. Now, theming in, in Magellan works with an override system. So if you're familiar with the way CSS works, you can reference your CSS files within the index or the starting application in a sequence. And 
the ones that follow can override the ones that proceed. So that's how we've set it up. The sequence that we have in our application is we start with main styles, which is the main style sheet of the application. And this is not something you should ever change. This is something that we distribute and we change, but it's very heavily commented and broken down into sections so that you can easily see how things are styled. The idea is you find the bit that you want to change, you can then copy it out of the main styles and put it into your application override, which is the theme style CSS. And this is again, another style sheet we provide, which is a ba the base style sheet. And then we have content styles, which are the actual content um, that you publish from your application. We do provide a default content styles um, style sheet, but often you'll need to um, add your own styles that you might have set up an author that we don't know about to the style sheet to style your content. So we've, we've specified that application overrides go in the, the theme style sheet and content overrides go in the content style sheet. Now the content style sheet is referenced last, so we can actually override all of them, but my advice is you keep this to content and you keep this to the application, it just makes it easier to manage. Now a little bit about CSS. Uh, CSS is, is a complex and uh, this, it's a very big subject matter all by itself, but I want to just, just highlight two key things you really need to keep in mind when working with CSS. Um, the first is element hierarchy. Uh, CSS is essentially styling elements that appear in your um, HTML or in this case our, our application. All elements in HTML are in a hierarchy. Um, and CSS will then find one of those elements and style. When you do find it and style it, you're using this box model to style it. Now, back in the old days, the behavior of a particular element type was, was kind of hard coded. Now it's more of a default and you can actually make any element behave pretty much like any other element um, simply by altering the CSS. You can make something that was like a, um, uh, an inline element like an EM or a strong, you can turn it into a, a, a block level element if you want. If you want bullets on it, you can do that as well. So there's pretty much every element you can do the same thing with. And so what we're gonna talk about is how to select them. Now selecting the element is where a lot of people struggle. Um, you can, and it's because of the hierarchy. So if I wanted to select this P element, I could select it by its element name, but that's really vague. Every P element would be selected. I could then also choose to select it by maybe an ID or an attribute. So you can use lots of attributes to select things. The typical ones that people use are IDs or classes. Um, and so you could use that as well. But again, every P element that has that class would, would be affected. So you can use a parent element as a way to specialize it. So you could say, I'm gonna look for something that's a div with a class followed by a P with a class, and then it will only select ones that have that. However, the reference is always down. So you can't, for example, select a div that has a P following it because your selector is always going down. So when you're choosing the P, you can, you can select it within the context of the div, but you can't do it the other way around. So, and that's a point where people often get frustrated. Oh, I want to select an EM that's got a, um, always got a P before it or something like that. So the box model is understanding that is key to kind of behavior and, and spacing and so on. There's actually, you see that we've got our content in the middle, padding, borders, um, margins, and then the external uh, dimension of the margin. There used to be a real problem where different browsers had different interpretations of the box model. Thank goodness that era is over and pretty much all of them render it the same way, which does making, make developing much, much easier and makes your CSS work a lot easier too because you don't have to consider different browsers too much these days. Okay, with that, I'm gonna jump across to um, this particular reference. Now this uh, reference site, CS, uh, the W3C schools is a great site for any questions you have about CSS properties and behavior. Um, I use this a lot. 
the one thing I want to look at is a CSS selector reference. This is really where a lot of the tricks in CSS come from. It's how do you choose the class you want? And there's tons and tons of ways to do it. As you see, you can use the standard class. You can use two class names that are together, for example. You can use one class name that follows another one and so on. So there's, this reference here is great. And we're going to go through a few tricks in here as part of what we're doing next. I'm not going to go into each one of these individually, but I do recommend that you have a look at all of the different ways that you can select things. Right. So with that, with that said, I want to now jump into our first set of, of uh, styling, which is going to be styling the application. I'm going to take you through the following types of, um, of changes. We're going to hide and change the color of our top icon menus. We're going to change the primary application font. Uh, we're going to look at highlighting of the selection and the topic, the, uh, the selection topic in, in the contents. Uh, we're going to style the search results and the progress bar, hide or show social icons, and then configure the scope of last modified topics. Now, this is technically not a CSS change, but it is a question that came out. Um, and so I just wanted to cover that off quickly. So let's jump straight into that. Okay, the way I've got this set up is I have my, my application or my um, Magellan application running here, and I use Visual Studio Community Edition to do all of my CSS ed editing. There are lots of tools to do this. I like this one because it's got a really nice um, uh, IDE and it, uh, it's got really good uh, type ahead, which uh, helps you uh, find all of the attributes without having to look them up. So first, let's look at the CSS. I've broken it down into sections, and those sections refer to the same, um, the same titles that I showed you before in the layout of the application. So we've got the, these two are, are basic stuff. If you wanted to learn more, you can click into layout. And you'll see this has got all of the comments that describe how the element structure is laid out for the content mode and the landing mode. Um, now you can discover this yourself using the inspector, but this just gives you an idea. And so when you want to look at the nav bar, for example, it's all contained under this navigation component or the right nav bar is contained in this hierarchy. So this gives you a great reference as to where it is. Now, when you go into each one of the individual sections, let's say, the, um, the header section, which is where we're going to do the first part of work, you'll see that we've got a similar uh, level of detail in here. And then all of the different styles have got comments in terms of how they work. Okay, so this is main style. So we're not making any changes here, but it's a great reference to see how things are done. We're first going to jump across the theme styles and I'll take you through some of the changes that we've made. So the first one was creating a new CSS variable, really easy, just define one. Now you define it this way against the HTML element so that it's available everywhere in the, in the um, CSS. And then you can just reference this in the same way that I've referenced it there. You can reference it anywhere. You can make it a specific color. I like to reference it back to the primary colors and then you can use it. So the first example I want to show you now is we're going to change the font of the application. So if we go back to the application here, right now it uses the standard font, which is the Open Sans font, which is a very nice font for web applications. But let's say you wanted to change it to something else. Um, I'm going to change it to the SegUI, which is a, a Microsoft font that they use. Make that change. And if we refresh that, you'll now see that that font has changed. It's, it is a subtle change, but it is there. It's a different, um, slightly different font. So you can make that whatever font you want, and that will affect all of the application. You'll notice that the content wasn't affected, and that's because the content styling is actually done by um, the content CSS, and we've specified the font there for that. The next one I want to change is the header overrides. So I'm going to go down here and look at hiding the navigation icons. Um, so go back to my 
you see here, I've actually got one of the icons hidden. These are the icons we're talking about here. I've laid these out now just for your own information. These style sheets that I've got here, plus the presentation will make available for download after the show. So you don't need to hurriedly scribble and write these things down because we'll, I will provide the full style sheets, both content and theme and the presentation. So you have those structured diagrams that you can look at. Um, so first let's look at this. This is how I've displayed. So I go display none. If I uncomment that, if I comment that again and save it, you will see after a refresh that this is now appears here. Okay, the next one I might want to hide is this one here. Now the configuration um, gear menu can also be hidden by simply disabling all of the items in the menu. So in your um, config, uh, site config, JSON file, you can actually turn all of these off. And the way it's designed is that if you've turned off the two in this section, then the section disappears and so on until there's no more left. And if there's none enabled, then the uh, config item is also um, not shown. But if you wanted to just turn that off anyway, um, it's pretty simple. You use this to select. So this is selecting the um, the, the, the list item and, and this is using a special, one of those special selectors to select the third child. And I'll show you how that works in code. So if we turn the inspector on, um, which is just control shift I, or if in your developer tools, you can usually get it from this menu as well and go to your web developer and turn on the inspector. I'm going to use the selector here and I'm going to point it at the item I want to change, which is this one here. It's very simple. You'll notice here that we have a class at the top and it's highlighting as we go that this is the, and it's got a class called top icon. You can use pretty much any class in here to reference it, but many of these are what they call helper classes um, rather than being the main class referring to this. And that's usually, um, you can interpret that from the name of the class. So I'm going to refer to this guy here, which is the um, unordered list um, element, and I'm going to use the top icons. Now I want to turn off right, this one here, but when I look at this element, it doesn't have anything that I can use to identify it. So that's where we use one of these selector tricks. And we're going to, we're going to use a selector trick called the nth child. And the nth child says, I'm going to select, an li that is a child of this ul, but it's the third child. Okay, and that allows me to select the third child. And then I can turn that um, display setting off. Now, the reason we have important is because on some of them, the display on or off is actually set on the element itself. When it's set on the element itself, um, this it overrides the style sheet. And yet, unless you use this important attribute, to override the element. So that, that will hide this element here, which is the third one. And I'll show you that, I'll save that. We'll do a little refresh and you'll see that that is now gone. Now it's still there. If we look in the code, it's just hidden. So you see that it's, um, here it is here, it's still there, it's just hidden. Okay, so the other one, um, the other thing to realize is when you're hiding these elements is that we actually have um, two sets of, um, we actually have two sets of elements. We have the element that is, or oh, sorry, of icons, the element, the icon that is there for the desktop mode and the mobile mode. So you've got to make sure that you get both of them. So there's my, my icon for the menu and you got to get both of them. So that's why I've referred to in my CSS, this second selector. So when you separate selectors like this and you comma, that means that whatever you put inside the curly brackets will refer to both types or both selected elements. So I've selected the top icon in the config menu. Now, luckily in this, in this particular one, it does have a class I can refer to. So I've referred to it specifically rather than using the nth child. 
So I can, I've put the examples here and you can turn any one of those on or off as you choose. So I'm just gonna put those back on. The next thing we wanna have a look at is the colors of the icons. Now you notice that I've actually set those to a color other than the primary. The primary is this purple color. So let's have a look at how I've done that. Um, the way that we can control those colors is because these icons are embedded SVGs. So if you had referred to an SVG or an image um, using an image tag, you can't do this. You have to use embedded SVGs for it. Now I'll show you how that works. In here, we've got an embedded SVG and the embedded SVG is basically just XML. So just like anything else, you can refer to it. And we've got um, an element here called top icons menu inside the path of the SVG. And so then we can use that um, re reference to be able to do things to the SVG. In this case, we're going to, we've referred to the um, to the icons. Now I've referred to the ones in the header, top icons and the menu. And I've used the fill um, CSS selector to change the color to the secondary color. Okay, so now some of you might be wondering why have I got heading desktop top icons? Because I want to specifically use the context of, of the, the heading, or sorry, the, the icons in the desktop header, not in the mobile one. Um, I don't want to recolor other icons. So sometimes you can use these to limit the scope of what the change affects, like we talked about before. So I've included parent elements to limit the scope. But again, these are the changes that I've made, and I've changed the ones on the, the iPad or the mobile menu to a light gray. Right, so that covers off hiding and changing the color of the top menus. I hope you like those examples. Um, and we've also covered off the primary application font. Now I wanna look at highlighting the selection in the contents. So if we scroll down here, you'll see the selection is changing. Now by default, we're just simply applying the primary color like we do up here and, and bold to it. But one of our users didn't feel like that was sufficiently highlighted. So I've, I've brought that out into the CSS so you can see how to do it. So here it is here. There are two things that you need to be concerned about. First is the container for the selected item. Um, and that's the one I've put this little border around and, uh, and styled it with a little shadow. And the second is the item itself, which is I've changed it to the secondary color and I've put font and I've made it a little bit bigger. It's typically 14 is the font size of the application. I just made it 15 pixels. And so now that you scroll through, you'll see that that is um, a bit bigger. You'll, because this is using the same control over here as we use here, you'll notice that both of them have adopted that that change, which is great. So if, whatever you want to change in there, once you've got those two selectors here and here, then you can go ahead and change pretty much anything about them. Just be careful though, because um, space is important. And so if you make it um, really big, for example, you start pushing the other elements around and it will, and everything starts looking like it's moving around, which isn't nice. So just when you're moving around, just make sure that everything else is remaining pretty static so that you're not um, drawing the user's attention away to too much movement. Okay, now let's um, take a look at the styling the search results and the progress bar. Um, so we've got search results in, I'll just hide this, it's a bit of a distraction. <clears throat> search results are, come across here and they, they come across on a, um, a slide overlay, I'm just gonna go back to normal here, slide overlay and, and typically the, the result or the percentage match is, comes from the primary color uh, or the second, yeah, the prime, the, sorry, it comes from this primary um, light color and the rest is just um, colored using bold. So there are several items in here we can 
target with a um, with CSS. Not not lot, not everything, but we can target a few things. So I'll take you through what we're able to do here. Um, first of all, this is the the body of the search results. So I can I can style the body of the search results to font size 14, to the padding, and so on. And then I can, in this case, I've changed, I've added um, a color to the to the highlighted word. Um, I could make make that whatever I wanted. I could put that yellow highlight. I could change the color if I wanted to there. And then I've changed the background color of the progress bar to a green. So those are simple changes. Again, um, you can make other changes to the header and so on. But for now, all I've done is change the highlighted word to be the same as the, um, as the secondary color. And I've made the search bar green. Um, next item we're going to look at is hiding or changing the social icons. Um, and so that's a section I've added in here. Um, first, we'll look at the social icons and where they are. So when you, when you do your share, which is here, these are the social icons I'm talking about. So you've got Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and email. Um, again, they don't have specific references, so we're going to use this nth child trick to find them. Okay, if you, again, if we look at our um, selector, we can go in here, select the icon we're after. We can see here there is a UL class called social share, um, and we're going to refer to the first, second, third, or fourth um, LI in that list. Now, when you start hiding them, um, they'll actually be left aligned and so it doesn't look very nice. So I've chucked this in here to center them all. So as you start hiding them, so let's say, you know what, I don't want to have Facebook in there. Um, they all still stay centered um, because that uh, it just looks nicer. You can see here now they're centered. Now we did get a question asked, can we configure these options? So at the moment when you click email, um, it will open up the email. Um, at the moment, unfortunately not. Um, however, this is a story that I have um, put into the system. So we'll try and, and add that later. Um, so you can turn those on or off as you wish. Now, if you don't want them at all, um, then the easiest thing to do is actually to hide the, the icon itself, which is the, um, the actual share in the in the menu. So I've put one there as well. And so I could uncomment that, for example. And if you look here, um, at the moment, we have that share there. If you don't want it, um, just hide the icon itself. And that disappears from the menu. So now you don't have it. Now you can so say you could hide the discuss, but that is actually will will hide itself if you turn it off um, in the settings but also you can turn that off in the config file so it doesn't even show up in the settings. And then it's not um, there or in here. Great. Um, there was also a, a couple of little things that I changed here. Um, the footer, uh, what I noticed is, and this is probably a mistake when we released it, is that when you'd go into a link on your footer, like our story, there was no space on the left or the right. So very simple change, just to add this in here um, and it'll give padding around it. Now we will add this to the main style CSS, but in the interim to fix that, you can just add that to your theme style CSS. Right, so that really covers off the CSS stuff I wanted to show you. And now what I wanna show you is the last item on our list, which is configuration of the scope of last modified topics. So I'm just gonna jump into author it for this. Um, and, and show you how that works. So in order to get this working, you have to define two variables in your, in your author at library. If you're on cloud, you, need to do, you can do this from where I selected. If you're on premises, you need to do this in the administrator module. So I've got to, one of them is called modified topic limit count. So if we go into that, modified topic limit count defines the, the limit of recently modified topics to include. So it's how many. Now, um, at the moment, if you said that there was 50 was the limit, then it actually 
only includes 49. So you just need to go one above the actual number you want. And the modified days limit is how many days does it look back into the past to consider them modified. So by default, it, I think it looks back infinitely and will um, limit it at 50. So if you want to change these, you've got modified topic limit days and modified topic limit count, both of those. Now, my advice is that you assign those to your publishing profile, but don't make them prompt. Um, it's unless you're expecting to change them every time you publish. I've got them prompting just for visibility at the moment, but you assign them to the publishing profile and just don't have prompt before publish selected or you'll have to fill them in each time. So if I were to show you how that works, when I go here and go Magellan Help Center, um, you'll notice that I can now specify those and those will carry through to the transformation that will limit the number of topics that will include. Um, and that will map through to inside of um, the Magellan application to the recently updated pages. So you'll see them all there. Those recently updated pages are what those two variables limit. So again, um, I will make sure that um, uh, that we get that get an article written up on that on the uh, on the community if you need more details. Okay, so that really covers off our application theming, which is uh, which is great. Now I'm sure you guys have more questions, um, but those were the questions I received, and anything else you can probably figure out using one or more of those answers and examples. So let's go back to the presentation and we're now going to take a look at the next stage, which is content examples. So this is, uh, this is where you can do some really nice stuff with your content. We're going to look at the following examples. Um, all of these changes are made in your content style CSS. For the first example, we're going to look at how do we change things based on topic templates or topic types? Um, and you can do all sorts of stuff there. I'll show you some example that we put together. Styles, tables based on our built-in and user-defined styles. Uh, we've got style on links and hyperlink based on hyperlink templates. Styles on images, even on captions based on the file object templates and also paragraph styles. Style video and video services like YouTube and Vimeo using um, elements and, and also paragraph styles. And then finally, we'll paragraph the style paragraphs and characters based on the style names and author it. So you'll most of you be quite familiar with this last one. Some of this other stuff might be new to you. So let's go through those. Okay, back in my application, in my Magellan application, I'm going to jump across to my style sheets. And this time we're gonna change to the content style sheet. In the content style sheet, we've got the sections again broken down of what we're doing. So each section is, is talking about one type of set of changes. So we'll start with the topics and then we'll move, move down. So if we look up here, we've, we're gonna make a specific change to a topic of type reference. Now, where does that come from? So in author it, when you define a topic, you apply a template to it. And in this case, the name of that template is a reference. Author it will take that name and it will normalize it. So it lowercases it all, takes all spaces away, and it will convert um, dashes and other characters to an underline. So you'll see that come through in the, in the application itself. So if we look at that, let's see if we can find a reference topic. I'm going to if you look at the underlying HTML inside the um, the actual HTML, every topic is inserted has an ID which is corresponds to its object ID. If there's more than one, you will, we we increment that so your first one will be this, and the second one will have an underscore one, two, three, four, and so on. If you've used the same topic multiple times. And then you've got a class, which is the template name. There's also some other data in here, um, which is, uh, is used by the application, along with any keywords that you've decided to put in here. 
So here we can now use this class reference to modify the look and feel of that as I have done here. You see I've put a box around topics of type reference. And how have I done that? Back in my content CSS again, I've just put a border around it, um, some shadow, some margin. And in this case, because there was margin on the H2 element inside, that was a little bit too much and didn't, it didn't look good. I just stripped that back to about five pixels. So oh, again, just going to jump in quick on line 25, you've got a syntax error. The semicolons got two and one of them should be on line 26. Might just Look break Matt, your no? That's terrible. <laughs> Matt, Matt's really good at picking up my mistakes. <laughs> um, so here is the, um, so this is the, the way that works. And we've also got uh, another little change I made here, which is I wanted to add a little bit of footer text. So we can do that using this after um, selector on the, on the reference class and we can add stuff. You can actually do things like this. This is a, I've added a, um, a uh, like an icon before. And so I'll, I'll just un, uncomment these so you can see how it works. Um, and I'm sure why it's done there, thank you. Um, and see the, the difference. So I'm now going to, And you'll see here, we've now got this icon that I put in there and we've got the footer text showing here. Okay, so it's a, really, it's a really nice little feature you can do to specifically highlight certain kinds of topics if that's what you want to do. Okay, um, not a big fan of this, so I'm just going to hide that again. The next thing I want to show you is how to um, look at the styles um, for the tables. So let's jump across to tables. We're going to collapse this region and, and we'll look at the tables. So tables is really cool. Some of the things you can do and there's two ways or generally two types of things you can do here. Every single table, that we publish out of author, it will be surrounded by a div called table responsive. And so you can use this one to do general styling of the, say in this case, spacing and margin around tables generally um, as a, so it's a container topic or container um, element. And then every table has been assigned a class called table. So you can use that to set general styles for all tables. And again, using the selector hierarchy, I can say a table of type table that is followed and in any time you see a table data or a table heading inside that you're going to apply the following styles so if it was a you know, like that that is it has to be immediately following if it's just a space it can be it, it can have any levels of hierarchy but it must be um, a table data found inside there and so that allows me to style things specifically for all tables. And so the example is that I've put certain styles like the shadow on here for all tables. And, and now I can specialize that. So the sequence of the way you do things in your CSS is really important. The, the things that you define here can be overridden by things after it. So in this case, um, I've also uh, changed the background color here is white for, for these ones, but then I've overridden it for table heading again and made the background color gray. So that's a way of, of doing it. So you, you can define everything as one and then override a few. Then you can specialize your table based on some specific styles, which we inject into the CSS. Um, and that's based on behavior. So by default, all of the, um, formatting that you have in author it will come through. So I'll, I'll show you that. Here is that style X1000 and it has this formatting here. Okay. And the same as this table here, it has a heading row. If we go to layout, it's got the heading repeat on and it's got um, borders, but no shading. Okay. So if we look inside and we inspect this first table, you will see that the div around it says table responsive, no header, because this has no header. 
It has borders and it has shading. It has a reference to the style immediately preceding the table, which we'll use a little bit later, and that's called body text, and a reference to the paragraph style that is first found in the first cell of the table. So this, this cell here has the this, this style table here. Now, the reason for that is that you can use those styles as well to specialize your table styles. Um, and then you've got the table itself. So if I scroll down to my second table, you'll see here I've got a heading row and I've also got these stripes. So where did the stripes come from? We go into CSS, that's another little trick you can do using a selector called the nth child and then even and nth child and then odd. So I've got two styles here. Every even row I'm going to make is blanched almond. Yes, that is actually a CSS defined color. And the other one is white or um, F. Now I can further specialize it and say I only want stripes when there is a header. So you notice in my first example, I didn't have stripes on this one. And that's because um, I'm actually not changing the body um, color. That color has come through from author it. And in this one here, I'm actually assigning stripes to it, right? But because it's got a header. So my assumption is if it doesn't have a header, I don't want to stripe it because it's not a data table, right? So you can use those styles like this. This example here, I've got a table that is used as layout. And I'll show you that over in author it. If I go back here, it's actually in my accessories subbook. I've got a um, one of this guy, one of these guys, I think. Here it is. So I've got this and I'm, you can see I'm using a table for layout. Now I'm not recommending that you use tables for layout, but lots of people do it. And so I just want to show you how to make sure that that doesn't show up in your, um, in your CSS or in your output as a defined uh, as a table. So here, what I've said is that if a table has got no borders, no shading and no header, then I'm going to just make all of the borders and shading disappear so that it doesn't end up with all of these defaults that I've applied to all tables. So let me go into the result and you'll see that. If we go down here, let's scroll down, you'll see there it is. And it's laid out without any borders or anything around it. So that's what you can do to change that. Um, and then lastly, um, I've specialized the border around tables that are inside the reference topic and I've made the outside border a dark gray. Okay, so um, again, you can specialize the tables based on what topic or types of topics they are in. So for an example of, um, of a regular one, this is them with a the light gray border. And if they're inside the particular topic of, of a type um, reference, then they have this dark gray border. Uh, now, the last one that I'm doing in here is called a um, uh, using a style that immediately precedes it. So I'll show you how I've set this up in author. I've got a really wide table and I don't want it to be squashed up when it is when it's being rendered because it makes it really hard to read. So this topic in author it is called a maintenance schedule. You'll see there I've got all of these, these number of trips that must be completed before the maintenance kicks in. And what I want is, is to be able to style that behavior specifically. Now I could have put the, the, the specific style immediately preceding it. So you see I've got a specific style here called wide table. I could have put it in the first cell here as well, but I've chosen to make it preceding. When you get that inside your CSS, um, it will come through as a as part of that div. So let's go and have a look at that. And you'll see here inside the inside the div that contains that table, right here, you'll see the wide table has come through. So I can use that now to refer specifically to this kind of table. 
And what I've done in this table is I have set it up so that it's going to have a minimum width of 800 pixels at which time it will start to scroll. So you set the scrolling overflow onto the parent element, which is that div, and then you, you limit the size of the table using the, using the table itself. And the behavior you get out of it is a very nice scrolling when it gets too thin, you see here, and now we've got the scroll bar shows up here, which I can use to scroll through that table. So even when you get down to a mobile size, that's gonna work quite nicely. All right, so that talks about our tables. Um, very cool. Um, links. Links are the next one I wanna take a quick look at. And links are, um, there's a variety of different links. Again, these are driven from template names. So let's have a look at some examples I've got here. If we go back to the, um, the CSS where I've got some set up here. Okay, I've got one in here, which is a hover on pop up. Uh, and I've got one here, which is a hover on click. And there's also other ones here. So by default, they're going to look like this. This is the standard way it's set up and you can override those based on link type. So if we look at a link type like here, you can see that it's got a span around the link called pop up on click template, which is again, the name of the author it template. So if I go into author it and have a look at that particular topic, crystal battery. If I double click there, I will see that we have got a um, template type of pop-up on click template. So again, once that's normalized and spaces are removed, that results in the class that we've got inside the CSS. So now I can refer to that pop-up on click. I've got the A element because remember that this is a span and the A is nested within it. So we're going to change the behavior and change the underline, put an underline it, make it dotted on the pop-up on click template. I've made it red, underline and wavy. And I've also taken off the little icon that shows up after it, which is the default behavior for those. So I've taken that off by just setting content to none on the after element. And that results in this look and feel. So there's lots of settings there you can go through. Again, look at the W3C schools and uh, you'll get to see what all of the various settings for underline types and decoration types. And you can change fonts and put boxes around it, make it look like a button if you like. It's pretty easy stuff once you, once you get um, familiar with all of the attributes. Okay, moving on to images. All right, images. Again, images come through with a with a, the file object template name associated with them. And we're going to look at um, how that works. So if we get an image like this one here, it comes through. The image itself has a class of embedded image on it. And the paragraph that contains it also has a class. So if I look at this, the different ones in here, you can use either the class that surrounds the image or you can use the image um, directly to do it, depending on what you want to do. Okay, I'm gonna take you through a couple of examples here. So the first example I, I wanna do here is to show you a float right. Again, there's two ways you can do this. You can either have a paragraph style, which you use, or you can have a, a template on an image. I've, in this case, chosen to use a, a um, template on the image. So if I go to author it, in author it, See if I can find that image, it should be in my accessories. And in my accessories, I've got a, uh, I think I have it in here. This one here. So I've applied a float right template to the actual file object itself. Um, and I've got a class around it, which is just based on image. So if I go across to the result, the result is that one will be floating right. 
and it'll make space for itself. Again, you can define how much space, what type of wrapping, um, all sorts of things, but it's, it's popped under there. You can do that with float left, float right, however you want to display that. Okay, I want to now use, um, show you how I've, how I've formatted a screenshot. Now this is um, just a, a way to perhaps reduce some of the work that you guys have to do. Inside, uh, most, most people when they take screenshots, they then go in and have to do all sorts of things like putting borders and shadows and things like that on them. You can actually do all of that with the CSS. You don't, you could save yourself some work and, um, and do it with the CSS rather than do it manually in the paint product. So let me uh, show you the image that I've got in here is actually just a very basic screenshot, no borders, no, no image. So um, no shadow, it's just the, the image itself. I have assigned um, again, a template to here called screenshot large and when it comes through to Magellan, it's now got this lovely shadow and a border and, and some soft edges on it. So how did I do that? Pretty straightforward. Again, we refer to the screenshot large. I see how it's it substituted the dash with an underscore and got rid of the spaces. Um, I've put a border radius on it, a border in the light color and a box shadow. And so that's created that nice appearance. So that saves me a whole bunch of work with not having to do that manually for every image every time I update it. Um, and the last thing I want to show you is a really cool um, little thing you can do with your captions. This is actually something Matthew pointed out. Um, and so I chucked this in just to show you some of the flexibility of the things you can do in CSS. Um, down here, we've got a case called the ProTech 1000. And what I've done is I've made the the caption just slide up and sit slightly overlapping the image and you'll notice there's even a little bit of a transparency as it comes through there. Really simple to do. In Authorit, I have put a, uh, on that particular, um, let's see, get my accessories book up again. In my particular um, book, I can go into the case, wherever it is, and I've assigned a caption style there, and this one's an image. And inside the CSS, I can now refer to those. So you see I've got the caption. And what I've done is, remember I've told you earlier that you can convert anything to anything. I've changed this from being a block element, um, which if I put borders around it would span the entire paragraph, to an inline block. So it's treated as, a, as kind of a box in its own right. And then that allows me to put borders around it and colors, and there's the opacity. Um, I've positioned it relative, which now means I can mess with the top and bottom relative to its current location. And I've put padding around it and a border radius. And I've even put a max width so that if it's a really long um, caption, it would actually just scroll down through. So if you go into here, what would happen is this would rather than go across, it would end up going down and you'd end up with a bigger box. So just a nice little touch there with, with captions. Okay, um, next we're gonna take a look at uh, the video stuff. Now videos, uh, lots of people wanna include videos in their content there. At the moment, the way you include videos in author is a little bit awkward and, um, and you must do it using what we call linked HTML, but the good news is this is changing and hopefully in our next version, we will have um, some really cool new features in the file object which allow you to define videos and video services directly so you don't have to um, do that yourself and see if i can find where this video is and author it so here it is here setting your teleportation device and it's simply a coded html file which has these video tags in it so it's a very simple file um, but it has the, um, the, all of the attributes that you need to control it. So I've done that and I've set the initial width and height here. Now, one of the big uh, problems with, with embedded video, particularly linked video, is getting it to behave correctly in a responsive way so that when you resize the screen, the video sizes with it. So this is what I'm gonna try and show you now. Um, sorry, I'll 
get into the resize mode. So this is what, what happens typically. So right now I've got this video which I've put into here. Here it is, here's my video. Um, but, and I've got a, a maximum size set for it so it doesn't get too big. But when I resize this, I want that video to change in size um, and get smaller. So that when I drop down to a web size or to a tablet size or to getting further down to a phone size, it's still visible and I can still play it. Now, typically with a video tag, that's not too much of a challenge, but where it gets really tricky is where you want to use a video service. So video service is, um, I've put in here, this one's using the Vimeo, but um, with the power of CSS, I've also managed to get that one behaving nicely. So you can see there, even a video service drops down and adjusts itself nicely based on the size of the video. Um, to do that, there's a specific way you've got to code this, um, this Vimeo uh, link, but let me show you how that works in the CSS. So first of all, we've got a general video paragraph, which I've got by assigning in author it a video paragraph style, right? So that's the first thing. And that becomes your container for the for videos. That's what I've put my little box shadow and, and borders and so on around. When it comes to the video tag, I've referenced the video tag by using the video um, itself. Now you could add a class to your video tag if you wanted to, and you'd be able to reference that. And essentially all I've done is I've maxed that out inside this box. And so it will stay 100% of its parent, which means this is doing a controlling of the size. When it comes to the iframes, there's some complicated stuff you've got to do here using a calc function, which is a really cool um, CSS uh, function that lets you do calculations for widths and heights and pixels and all sorts of things. Again, look at the, 3C, the, the W3C schools for that. Um, this is a little trick that makes it work. I'm not entirely sure how that works, but it does. So again, you, you, you modify this and then again, it stays relative to it. So that's videos. And again, you guys will get all of this. So don't worry about uh, having to scribble it down quickly. Um, and now we've got nice videos inside our output that behave nicely, even when in a mobile size device and they play right inside the, uh, there you go. So let's, um, let's go to the last step in this section, which is modifying paragraph and character styles. That's actually the easiest one. Um, what I've done here is I published out to plain HTML from author it and it generates a style sheet. And I've just taken that style sheet and popped it in here because that has all of my styles. So that's a starting point, And then you can replace things, remove things from there. Um, my suggestion is, um, you, you use that as a way to create, um, to make sure you've got all your styles included, but, uh, but do try and normalize them a little bit. Uh, the previous version was quite verbose. So if we look at this, I'll show you something that I've done here. I've done, um, one thing I've done is I've added a little element here, which gives me a font uh, awesome icon on my, um, my procedure heading. So I'll show you how that works. See the procedure heading here, this little icon is actually defined by, by this little section here. Now font awesome is included by default with Magellan. So it's a, it's an easy one to reference. You set you set it using the content before and the content. And now I've put some padding in there to create some spacing. You refer to the font, and you can put color and weight and so on as well. So how to use Font Awesome? It's really simple. Um, jump onto their website, fontawesome.com. Um, search for what you want. So in this case, I wanted a right arrow. And it pops up with the different, different ones. Oh, there's the one I want. Any of the dark ones are included by default. If you want to use any of the rest, you will have to license Font Awesome. 
um, and, and include that additional library. At the moment, we only use the open source version. When you go into here, you'll see this little code. It says copy Unicode. You copy that, jump back into your style sheet, and that's the one you paste into there. So very simple. You can put any icon you want in there. And that's how we do pretty much all of the icons in Magellan. Right, so that's how you create advanced theming in Magellan. And so let's jump back to our presentation now. And the next thing to do is to really just give you an idea of the types of things that are um, coming up and that you guys have requested. So we've got heaps of feedback from you guys. So thank you very much for your continuous feedback. It really shows us that you're engaged and, and want the, the product to, to get better and to have more capability. Um, we've been digesting all of that feedback and distilled it down into a few, uh, into a list here that, that I wanna share with you. But if you've got more suggestions, please jump on community.author.com and share those with us. Um, please have a look to see if it's already there so we don't double up on stuff. But um, if it's already there, go in and add your uh, vote and your voice to it. Um, and if it's not there, feel free to add it. So the types of suggestions that we've got is the idea to add a topic, to allow sort of what topic templates did with HTML5 where you can define uh, like a shell that the content's injected into so that you can have things at the beginning, things at the end, variable substitution, and so on. So that's, um, that's one of the suggestions. It's a good one. We haven't decided exactly what mechanism we'll use to do that, but that's a good idea. Um, configure the initial expansion state of the table of contents. That's been a popular one. Um, so we're planning to put a config option in that will allow you to specify what its expansion state is and how many levels um, you want in it, whether one, two, three, or all kind of thing. Um, the configure footer, um, yeah, so we've had uh, people ask if they can have the footer to appear also in the content section, so not just the landing section. So we're going to add a config option that will allow that to be in the landing, in the content, or both. Um, switch between infinite scroll and page view. This is a um, suggestion. Some people prefer the old page view. It's not something we're, um, we're thrilled about because it actually, if you think of this from a mobile perspective and the scrolling perspective, infinite scroll is what makes that experience possible. And if you took that away, um, it would make a mobile experience much, much harder to manage. Um, so we'll figure out what we can do there, but um, it, it will damage the mobile experience and the, the sort of the um, iPad experience as well. Uh, Multi-book sites. This is a, a oft-requested one um, with filters and links between and search, and that's something we're working on. It's it's not a, an easy one, but we're uh, we're definitely looking at that one. And configure the social button behavior. So when you share, and uh, what's the um, what's the behavior of that? When at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, we've kind of defaulted some subject for the email and people want to be able to configure that. And um, last but not least, they want to configure the header, size of the logo search areas and add custom buttons into the toolbar. We did have a request around, you know, changing the size of the search area. At the moment, that's kind of locked into the application. So we need to um, make some changes to allow that. So just, uh, to let you know we are listening and and we definitely have these things in the pipeline um, but please continue to provide us your feedback and now we've reached a favorite part which is question and answer so i'm, I'm just going to slap my uh my video back on and i will also ask matthew to help me out with these questions that no doubt he has been collecting as we've been going through well, I think, Paul, everybody's been paying so much attention that they haven't had a chance to formulate any questions. We've got one question from Justin, so you might want to um, talk to that. Yeah, I'll just drag that up. Okay. Um, so any plans to define the top icons, non-mobile classes in the future, um, avoiding the nth tile? Yeah, these are, all, these are all things, Justin, that um, we kind of didn't know what people wanted to, to reference and, and did. So as we learn, we'll definitely look at uh, finding better ways to reference those. Um, 
and add classes or IDs to those so that people can reference them more easily. Absolutely. So um, please feel free to throw any questions that you've got in there um, and, and I'm here to answer them. So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to throw some questions in, otherwise we'll be able to finish up. I've got a question, Paul. Oh, of course you do, Matthew. <laughs> so you've dug into some pretty sophisticated and useful CSS stuff. Um, where did you learn a lot of that? And how long does it take to kind of not just pick up what CSS does and how it works, but how all of this applies to the insides of Magellan? Um, so CSS is um, it's an evolving field and over the last few years in particular, there's been some amazing um, changes and, and really, really improve what you can do with CSS. And, and particularly the browser is also becoming more standardized that has helped it. But there are so many resources on, um, on the web that you can simply go there and, and do a search for most of the things you want to do and, and see that, um, see how people have done it. But the, the two main sites that are there, there's Mozilla's got a, a really great site and, um, and the W3C schools. Uh, but if, if you're stuck on something and you want to know question, want to know how to do something, just chuck in into the community and we'll be happy to help you out. Um, we you know, as everyone gets more skilled with CSS, then you guys will be able to start helping each other out as well um, from your learning. So our, our goal here is to give you guys the skills that you need to, um, to be able to customize and, and create amazing outputs for, for your customers and for your internal customers. Um, Paul, there's a couple of other questions in the chat. Um, Camille asks, are there plans to allow other types of links in the resources section? So Camille, I'm assuming you mean different types of files, not just spreadsheets and PDFs, but possibly um, DXF drawings or uh, other kinds of binary documents. So if you want to clarify what you mean by links, do let us know and we'll, we'll talk to no, you. No, she, get it. Yeah, oh. it's great. So in, in the, um, you can define that, that is in author it, you can define um, a series of links that you want. Again, you define it using a variable and then you specify that. Um, so if you go into variables here, I've got one called um, resource file types. And again, it has to be assigned to your publishing profile, but the format is quite simple. You, you, you choose, I've put it in as a, as a multi-select list here, but this is the format it uses. The extension that it looks for, the name that you want to give it the nice name, because that is used um, for alt text, and the icon that you want to use. And so it looks for that icon in the, in the images folder, and the default is that it will do PDF, Excel, and, and Word, but you can add your own. And provided this resource file types has an assignment against the publishing profile, it'll pick those up and you can set any graphic, um, any resource type you like. I hope that answers the question. Um. Hamish asks, is it possible to skip the landing page completely? And I know a few other people have asked about this as well. Um, definitely something we could put in there, Hamish. Uh, it's not something that we've, um, that we've got in the current um, list of, of changes, but uh, I'll, I'll make sure that one gets in there. Um, it uh, seems like a bit of a waste, but yes, we can do it. <laughs> Uh, okay, the, there was just a suggestion here from one of the other users that Code Academy is also a great resource um, for CSS for those of you out there. Okay, any other questions we've got there coming through? Yeah, there's a couple that have come through in the Q&A. So Samantha asks, we can change the top menu icons by altering the underlying JavaScript. What is our stance on customers modifying the icons in this way? And will future versions of Magellan make such JavaScript changes obsolete? So this is a good question because it's, yeah, obviously you can change a lot, Paul, but clients are wondering about 
how is this going to be supported both by the support team and as updates are made? Yes, so if we're looking, the icons themselves are currently embedded SVGs. So you're right, the only way that you can substitute the icons um, for different ones would be using JavaScript. Um, the adding new stuff, and these are all part of the, the things that we're considering as we move forward. The reason that I've emphasized do not make changes to the styles, um, the main style CSS is because that is where we're making changes. Do not make changes to the underlying JavaScript because they will be overwritten. So if you keep your changes to, to just the theming um, and you can add things, you can add JavaScripts, for example, to your index page, the idea is that you will not be able to, um, you, you will not get overwritten, right? So in our next Magellan webinar, we're gonna get into JavaScript and how to extend or the um, Magellan with some JavaScript. But um, we're trying to design this in a way that as we release new functionality, you can either remove or replace any customizations with built-in functionality as we add it, or, um, or they should still continue to work alongside it. Advanced search functionality. Yes, at the moment, the search engine we use, for those of you who want to take a look, it's called Luna. It's a JavaScript-based search engine, L-U-N-R, um, sort of like a, a dimmer version of Solar. And um, it, uh, it does have a bunch of configuration options, but we haven't exposed those yet. So give us a bit of time to, uh, to add those to the configs and hopefully you'll have some more control over that. And that would be in the advanced search, which would be alongside filtering and so on. Um, the, filter sort, the filter options, yeah, again, filtering, search, those are all options that would be added. And I'm assuming that the filtering would be something that you'd do to the TOC based on what you've typed into a, a box or some options. So I hope that answers those questions. Um, embedded audio files. Yep, and audio files can be done exactly the same way we did videos, just use the audio tag. So it will, um, if you use the, the audio tag in the linked HTML and they will be, or they will be defaultly supported by the file object in, um, in an, either the next release or the one after. Yeah, and Jody, you asked a question about audio files. It's worth checking out Author at Honeycomb, which is the e-learning specific output from Author at, that does have a lot more control for um, closed captions, voiceovers, etc. Yep, and we will be running a series of similar webinars for Honeycomb once we're ready. Okay, well that, um, that seems to bring us to the end of the questions. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and wish you all a, a really great rest of your day. Um, keep safe um, and uh, keep healthy. And we'll see you back again, hopefully for the third webinar and to learn a bit more about advanced JavaScript and, uh, and some responsive um, CSS design. So thanks again for attending and have a great day.